Hi there, my name is Denny Brandt, and welcome to Speak Dicely, the podcast where I get together with other tabletop enthusiasts, and we speak dicely together. If you're a regular in a tabletop RPG group, have you considered how much trust has to be shared between all the players? If you've been playing with close friends, you might have taken this trust for granted. For our games to be efficient, there needs to be trust at the table. Otherwise, things will devolve into chaos, and what was meant to be a fun experience can turn into hurt feelings and conflict at your table. Joining me today to talk about trust in RPGs are Jason Thompson, Dallas McKenzie, and Logan Cracknell, otherwise known as LC Kraken. Hey there, folks. Hi. Uh, How's it going? Good. How's everybody today? Solid. Started the long weekend. I'm ready to go. I forgot (laughs) this. You know what? This dates the episode, but oh, whatever. I'm sorry. I immediately ruined things. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We don't record it right before it's put up. (laughs) What? What? <laughs> they don't know which long weekend. That's right. The, mm. yeah. uh, the February long weekend. The March long weekend. <laughs> I'll get you all the sound bites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is insert long weekend. Can we have a take for December? Go. The December <laughs> long weekend. <laughs> all right, perfect. Uh, now let's move on. No, but <laughs> there's a long weekend coming up. I totally forgot that there was a long weekend because time seems irrelevant. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, without that nine to five going on, what the hell is a long weekend? (laughs) That's right. What are the numbers nine and five? Like a job, a nine to five. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, wait, wait. Daddy, (laughs) let's talk about this. Daddy, the pandemic's only been a year. You don't forget what nine to fives are. I've rolled several D20s and never have I rolled a nine or a five. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds nice. Yeah, those that would actually be great. If you'd never rolled a nine or a five, yeah, 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 those are pretty bad rolls. All you have to do is play a, a what is it, eleventh level thief? Yeah, <laughs> can't roll lower than a ten. Uh, on skills that you're proficient in, but I miss my rogue. Oh God, rogues are so good. What a good guy. Well, today we're talking about trust in tabletop situations, and the reason I brought you all in here specifically is. We've all played together, so we've all got some stories about this kind of topic at our table. And a recent campaign that Dallas Logan and I played in, there was quite a bit of practicing this trust required. (laughs) So in your guys' opinion, what does trust look like in a tabletop role-playing context? Uh, Trust is is a particularly interesting thing where there's kind of an unspoken social contract that you're going to share a common goal. Like, whatever that goal ends up being within the game. And the idea that you're not going to use the rules within the game to take away from the experience for other players. And I actually, when I started playing D&D, prior to it in high school, I tried out a game of Pathfinder. And it never worked with my friends because at level two, they all decided to just attack each other instead of do anything in the missions. And of course the DM allowed it because it was the choices we were making. But at the end of it, when one of us was alive and the campaign was over because we had killed each other, it's kind of like, is this all tabletop RPG is? And it actually kind of dragged me out of the game for quite some time. I hadn't played for several years until I had met a group in university. And so like sharing a common goal and making sure that the players are in agreement that they are there to tell a story is hugely important or else, you know, you'll end up with one person just abusing the rules to do things in the world that is degenerate towards others. I gotta say, I love this idea that your first interaction <laughs> with it is like, this game ends at level two because everyone just kills each other. There's 20 levels in this book, but they don't matter. That's right. How am I ever going to get ridiculous. there? <laughs> you get level one of adventure, level two of everyone dead. Yeah, that's, that's all that happened. <laughs> yeah, that's... It was so sad, though, because it just took everything away, right? I think, like, a big thing is the... It, not even necessarily, in my eyes, the, yeah, we're all achieving a common goal in the game, but the idea that, like, everyone at the table wants everyone to equally have fun. It's not about someone having the most fun. It's about, like, everyone sharing in a good experience. Kind of that idea of you can't win D&D. Exactly. You can only lose. (laughs) (laughs) 
varying degrees of loss. Great. Yes. My DM. <laughs> yeah, I have two of the people at this ta- uh, the, this talk's DM, and now I've just said Super. there's only loss in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think the big thing is like, yeah, it's not about it's not a competition. You know, we're all in this together, and uh, you know, it takes time to build trust, especially with uh, with new people. And I think it can be really hard going into a table where everyone knows each other on both ends, like that table that maybe has been playing for a year and has a new player, the, the trust there, if they've never played with them. I think there's always a, like a, a wariness or something, but also being that player who's never played with like a group of people and going in can also be an interesting thing to navigate. I think a table that has a lot of trust in it, in my mind, is a table where people are like willing to like really get into like the role play as well. Um, you know, I would have trouble, you know, sitting down at a table with people I maybe didn't know and like doing a character voice or like, you know, suggesting something outlandish or like, you know, I think a, a table with a lot of trust in it is also one where you feel or where all the players feel like they can suggest things and aren't going to be like made fun of or ridiculed for making those suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you've got trust on the role play front. And I think there's also a sense of trust required on the mechanics front as well. Like trusting that players are building their character sheets correctly. Or if you're running with a lot of homebrew, like I know recently with like Dallas and Logan with creating their characters, I went over their D&D Beyond characters to kind of make sure that Everything seemed kosher with the bunch of homebrew that we've been doing. And that wasn't out of mistrust, but out of I'm sure somebody's going to be confused about all these rules we're adding to the game. And then there's like DMs who if you've got a DM screen in front of you, how often are you fudging dice if you're fudging dice at all? Like you got to trust that nobody's abusing the rules for their own gain and kind of bringing it back to it's all for the enjoyment of everybody that's at the table. Yeah, I mean, there's also, uh, I can't help but think of uh, another kind of moment I had when I was learning 5e, where I felt like I was the least knowledgeable about the rules at the table. And it wasn't about necessarily wanting to break the rules to my gain, but it was simply about making sure I was following the rules correctly. And there's a little bit of this kind of social embarrassment when you think that you're going into a game and you have to know all your own rules you don't want to be the one at the table to like ask too many questions to slow down the game and i definitely have had moments where i've had to realize i'm like no i just have to ask this question and admit that i don't know the rules and i think that's been a a huge part of trust building with some of the dms and other players that i've gone through and played with because like every campaign I've played, like I haven't memorized my character. And then, and I, I had this expectation that everyone did. And it turns out that, you know, you learn how to play the game as you're playing the game, just like any other game in existence, you get better at it as you play. And to think that there is some like preconceived concept that you have to know everything when you sit down, isn't exactly true, but certainly if someone were to ask about the rules and then be belittled for not knowing them, I could see that being an issue of trust as well. There, there's sort of this openness to being able to ask questions that I think is really important as you're playing through the game. Yeah, yeah, just being able to trust if you're going to ask questions that you won't be belittled. And then there's also on the DM side, because Jason is a funny example. I love you, Jason. Because... <laughs> Your your character, I, I don't know how many sessions in we had, but you were a druid and you had been using Thunderbolt for such a long time. <laughs> and it was so funny the day we realized that's not actually a spell you have access to. And we just played it off that it, it was really funny that you kind of misinterpreted your rules on your end. And we're like, all right, well, we'll just correct that for future that you can't use that spell moving forward. But... Yeah, it, it, it kind of became a joke f- for our group that <laughs> you you didn't quite plan out your character fully, but we made sure that we worked with you to get it correct. And, and that's the thing, right? It's like th- there kind of comes a point where you realize you've messed up and you're like, well, we're here now. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> we're not going to try and take back 10 sessions of me casting lightning bolt unintentionally, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I shouldn't have. 
Uh, where do we go from here? Well, we're not going to erase all of that because it was all fun and good. But moving forwards, let's just not let him cast Lightning Bolt because you shouldn't have been doing it for the past nine sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. I imagine that's like staggeringly common in D&D, though, is you oh, realize sure. 10 sessions in that you've been doing something wrong the entire time. Oh, yeah. We're 10 sessions into mine and Adrian just found out that his knife should be doing more damage. <laughs> Yeah, like that happens to me all the time. I'm actually so I'm I'm playing a monk now and I didn't realize at a certain level my hands become magical damage. And so we were facing a creature that had all these resistances uh and then one of the other players was like, "Aren't your hands magical?" and I'm like, "As far as I'm aware, my hands are regular." <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> <laughs> going through the rules, being like, whoa, monks have magic hands. <laughs> this is incredible. That's a great moment for that character. Right? Also, with the like the trust at the table, and this gets back into the the not like it's not about winning, it's not like a competition in, in D D. You know, you're with these other players. It's like, oh, you notice someone's doing something wrong, tell them. Like if someone has missed like missed a rule. And they're not shining as much as they should. Like, it's not going to take spotlight away from those moments you were shining. You know, let them remind them that they, in fact, do have magic hands. Yeah, it's kind of funny how you can use those elements to even just craft it into the story and make it canon as well to create a sort of welcoming and trust. And I guess, uh, and I wonder for the DMs here, if there's like strategies you use to create trust at the table. Like, is there anything that you think about that you're like, these are things that I do to make sure the players feel comfortable and ready to go? If there's any sort of exercises that go along with that. I play with the same group of players that I've been playing (laughs) with for the last, like, seven years. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that... There's definitely that side of it where, of course, the more often you play, the more comfortable everybody's going to be together. But it's not in everyone's reality where that that can be the case. In in a situation where it doesn't seem that everyone knows each other, I might do – well, it, I think it's all got to happen in session zero. Like, you got to set down your ground rules like – Here's how I'm going to make sure we stay safe in role play because safety and fun is overall what we want out of this. Like there's the TTRPG safety toolkit, which you can find online in a PDF, and it provides a lot of good resources for staying safe while playing in a role play setting. And, you know, just having these ways of letting your table know if you're uncomfortable or if if topics are things that you shouldn't be doing. And then there's exercises you can do in the sense of like pairing up players. If you're like, okay, you two know each other, figure out those details and giving them an in-story connection to kind of make them, or at least attempt to establish a bond between their characters. And that might help bridge a connection as players as well. For the campaign that we're working on, Denny, we did do a session zero where you sat us down, you did this. You went through, are there any off-limit topics? Um, And I really appreciated it because we are playing with a group that I don't necessarily play with. A couple of people on there I didn't meet. I'd never met before we started talking about this campaign. So it was nice to sit down and like, at least like, you know, even if things do go awry, I at least understand that this table has the infrastructure to address these things. Like, I know it's something that's on your mind. I know it's something that's on everyone's mind. We've had this conversation. We're all in agreement of that. So I think, you know, even in a group, maybe where there are a lot of people who have played together before, it's nice to still sit down and have that, you know, just conversation so that we all know that we are on the same page. We're all working towards this goal and we're working towards playing safely and having fun together. Yeah, I really appreciated it as a player. Back to you. (laughs) (laughs) Does, Does anyone have any stories where there was a lack of trust between players? And how did that situation unfold or was there a resolution? I had one and it was... I think it was a mix of like it was it was in university playing with a group. And I think it was getting into that again, like people were wanting to win D and D. People were wanting to to outshine each other. And it was a, a player who kept using and it, it made no sense in terms of what we were doing at the table, but like kept using out of character knowledge to try and like foil each other's plan. So I was playing a changeling 
And I was like, oh, what I'm going to do is like, I'm just going to leave, change myself as this like diplomat and come back and deal with this stuff. And they were like, oh, well, I'm going to like try and catch you in the act. Cause like they hadn't noticed, like known that yet. And uh, like, I was like, why, why are we doing this? Like we're both working to this thing together. Your plan didn't work. I'm trying to help you get this thing. And it was just, it became really awkward. And that, that group definitely dissolved as, as it went on. Cause it was just like, okay, like none of us like want the same game. It seems. I've definitely experienced some level of unease with people who try to like maximize their abilities as opposed to playing to benefit the story. And I, and I suppose it's because of who I am as a player. I don't necessarily make the quote unquote correct move. I make the move that I think is the most fun. And usually I, of course you don't want those kinds of moves to lead to the detriment of other characters and you never let that happen. But when you have other people who choose to basically kind of take over combats or be the protagonist in a party, that can get difficult because you may have a character that you're excited about. and You're like, oh, I want this particular moment to shine or I'm hoping that something will happen. And then that never happens simply because one character is kind of taking the spotlight. And that's kind of hard because it's it's kind of this I, I, I'm not sure as a DM or a player, how you can actually balance when one person tries to be the protagonist other than a kind of outside conversation. That's like, do you tell them like, Hey, I'm going to try to make this thing for this other player. Would you mind not like taking over with your plans or getting everyone to go with what you are saying? But I've definitely had it before where people have tried to kind of take over the game to fulfill their own plot and not letting other characters take the spotlight. And I think that erodes trust and kind of creates unease at the table. And I would say a specific story, but I would be getting into a very long and prolonged session over session. <laughs> like <laughs> they did this and then they did this and then they did this. And it, it's, and that's kind of the funny thing about trust is that it's not necessarily like they did one thing and they broke your trust. It's like, it could actually be chronic almost. Where it's like, oh, this person keeps doing this minute thing over and over. And you get to this point where other players are interpreting that as sort of social bullying of sorts, which is tough. Like, where do you kind of go from there, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think you're right in your, um, your instinct as to how to resolve that. I think that would also be a, a conversation to have outside or after the game, because... Like you're saying, these minute things, they build up over time and it's better to stem it like when it's noticed. And Dallas was mentioning this, too, like even though we have a group of people that are quite familiar for the most part, it's still good to sit down and like have these conversations because you might not want to confront your friend or it's like, oh, it's just for the game. It's fine. But if it bothers you, even if they're close, like a close friend. Like, it's good to just sit down, have the conversation, because assuming that you're wanting to come back to the game, it might still be a problem if you don't talk about it. Well, and especially like you don't want that kind of conflict de escalating outside of the game as well. Like you really don't want like that. That's kind of the worst case scenario, right? If you if you have this group together that comes together to have fun and then one person keeps uh doing a series of actions that's making it harder for everyone to play, absolutely nip that in the bud because conflict debt adds up. Like that's a thing, you know, like even though it's kind of the same thing over and over, it actually kind of gets more and more emotionally intense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want these things to bleed into your player and player friendships or relationships. If you're not friends, I would assume you're at least acquaintances or getting to know each other. Sometimes though you end up playing D and D. With, with people that you completely don't know. Like I've played with groups at comic stores and stuff and hobby shops. And honestly, I think, yeah, it was like one of those things was going into a group like that, right? Absolutely no, no one, not even the DM at the table. That like first like bit of the session is like really trying to gauge like, what is this table? Is it one that I want to jive with? Like usually everyone is a decent person and you know, I think I've thankfully never had a, a moment where if something came up and I was like, hand up, 
I realize I'm doing a hand up. No one can hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if someone at the like DM or another player doesn't kind of respect how you're feeling in a moment like that of something that's unsettling or whatever it is that makes you uncomfortable, I think there's a good chance then with that table, like you will be better off just finding a new table. If someone's not going to respect how you feel, and if you feel that like player trust has been broken and you bring it up and they still don't, then I think like, yeah, it's like just find another group that will, you know, respect your time and who you are. <laughs> yeah. I I do have one other story. I was I was a player in a group and overall I'd call the the group that was playing rather rather fresh. The DM was had played quite a few games, but the three other players that were with us were still pretty new. Maybe I played one or two sessions. And in a session, we were doing a mission. One of the players had done an action and it had consequences that resulted in their character's death. And unfortunately, the other two players kind of belittled that player and made fun of them for making a clearly bad choice. And that player ended up leaving in a bit of a huff. And I don't think that group ever played together again. And that was an unfortunate situation, which also should have been the DM stepping in to be like, okay, guys, it's not cool. We're here to have a good time. Like mistakes happen and, and characters die in D and D that will happen. But unfortunately I think it kind of got left in an awkward air that wasn't good for that group. Yeah. That's really unfortunate because I'm sure as well that people were like, you know, joking around, like they didn't mean it maliciously. So it's hard to figure out like, how do you like, like it's that's why I'm saying it's nice to have like that infrastructure in place to be able to say like hey like I don't feel comfortable with this or like hey can we chill out or like yellow card like let's chill out now because I'm sure you know it's not always an intentional thing and even in a group of friends I could see how that could happen Mm -hmm. yeah and I could tell they weren't being malicious it was just like oh that's unfortunate why did you make those bad decisions but that Mm -hmm. player clearly took it quite personally and I I personally I don't know if they ever played D and D again, which is most unfortunate. What about stories requiring a lot of trust that turned out in a more positive light? <laughs> Logan, do you want to talk about what it what it feels like to DM <laughs> two characters that constantly <laughs> scream at each other? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting things that came from this campaign that I ran that Dallas and Denny had both been a part of, along with other friends who have have been on past episodes, and. There were definitely moments where I had to sit there and be like, do you, like after the session, like let's do a check in everyone, everyone feeling good. And like right away, the players did that because there was like intense, like a half hour of the session, two characters in character arguing, like heated argument. And then it was afterwards, it's like everyone good. I think Denny at times was like, I haven't crossed any boundaries, right? Like the fact that the players instantly went into checking in with each other made me really comfortable as a DM to let things play out at the table. There was one moment where I thought PVP was going to happen, where I was like fully ready to be like, hard stop, do both players want this? Because if you don't, I'm fine to like, I don't think anything is so precious in the story that like can't be reversed if it's going to mean like literally the difference between someone having a terrible day or a terrible rest of the campaign and like, that I think the the story that I think required a lot of trust between players and like really I think this one was with like the players and the DM was the ending of that where the way that it ended was all the players knew someone was going to need to like sacrifice themselves it was a situation where someone's life was going to bring a new life into the world and restore balance I gave an NPC I was like here's an NPC that's willing to do it if no player wants to. But Michael's goal the whole time had been bring this person back. So Michael's like, no, I'm going to be the person to do it. I'm a master druid. It's about nature. That's me. And Denny's character is like, I'm older than like most of you. I lived a terrible life. I This is my redemption arc. And, you know, both players were telling me the things that they wanted to do to get to the thing. And there was like, all these secrets behind that I think absolutely required the players to trust me in terms of not letting each other know what like they were planning because they were 
in a weird way, as much as I said, D and D is about working together. This one moment is two <laughs> players actively working against each other, but also so much trust between each other because both of them knew they were actively working against each other. Like in this moment, like both of you knew that like my goal can't be completed if you get yours. And it was definitely intense. Like, you know, it ended and there was a heaviness because in, in this case, uh, like Denny's character succeeded and Michael's didn't. And now Michael's character and like Michael is a fantastic player at the table who gets really into his character. His character is like, my friend is dead because I didn't get to do the thing. And like, there's this, this moment and we all, you know, talked afterwards and stuff that I think absolutely couldn't happen at a table where everyone wasn't fully trusting each other. And that whole campaign couldn't have happened at a table where people didn't trust each other. And I think like, I would love to hear Dallas and Denny as they had probably the most conflict and player trust things come up during it. Well, I, w- I want to touch on that one quickly just for a sec to say that the interesting situation of these myself and uh, our previous guest, Michael, um, we were working against each other, but it was also for each other because like it was to the benefit of the other person. That's one of us succeeded. Like he didn't want me to die. I didn't want him to die. So even though we were working against each other, it, it was selfless. It, it wasn't a malevolent act. It wasn't because I want to see you fail. It was because I want to see you live. And we got this beautiful moment at the end where very kind of tangent, I realized, but <laughs> the end of it is Michael's character had this whole time been like praying to the gods of the elements. And Denny's character essentially sacrificed himself to bring back one of those gods. And so Michael prayed at this destroyed temple to the, the earth god and got to have a last conversation with his friend who had taken on this new role. And I was like, it was just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it could not have happened without players that trusted in me as a DM and that I trusted like both them and that they trusted each other. And yeah, it was lovely. Dallas, would you like to take it away on the, uh, the other issue? The other issue? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know how this happened. <laughs> I don't know. Our, our characters were just so so opposed to everything the other character loved (laughs) you know i was like i was playing a character who was like he dreamed of being a pirate like a great pirate and you had a character who hated pirates and it just like but i don't think any of those things were like immediately clear the problem with my character with shadow was that he was so like so insecure about himself and then you show up this like great pirate lord from the past I know you ran your own ship. Shadow's this poor little 18-year-old kid in a 40-year-old body who's trying to figure out how to run a ship. He has a whole crew all of a sudden. He has no idea how this has happened. And all of a sudden, this guy shows up, and he's like, you all suck. You guys shouldn't be pirates. Uh, but I was a great pirate. Uh, and it was it was very stressful. <laughs> it was it was a really interesting moment, I think, for me as a player because it also like brought out a lot of like my own insecurities in d d where like I am a person who doesn't know the game as well as a lot of other people at the table, right? And so I think a lot of myself ended up in Shadow, and I think that's why a lot of this got very heated, because it was like, not that, you know, I don't know how to describe all of this, because there was never a moment where I was ever like, oh, this is ruining our friendship or anything like that, right? Like, it was always very fun, but it was always like a big part of me was in it. And, and I think that's why this whole thing got very emotional and got very tense. And why we had to check in after <laughs> after the fact and make sure we were still okay, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I would love to hear it more from from your perspective as well. Oh, that that <laughs> actually kind of hits me really hard to hear you say all that because I also put quite a bit of Theodore in myself in the sense that like I've I, I hold myself to quite a high standard and I feel like I've not always met it and also am currently not meeting the standard I've set for myself. And I kind of put a lot of that anxiety into Theodore. There's somebody who has this facade that they put forward and he was the big character of secrets. That was his thing. He was perceived as one thing, but had a total storm going on behind the scenes. And it was very interesting to play a character like that because also I did not make him good at deception It's just that 
his front was so good, it wasn't lying. It was just a second truth in a way that he didn't fully believe in. And yeah, so I brought this character in. It was interesting that we ended up so diametrically opposed because he knew. And again, it it all kind of came from a place of selflessness that just got perceived as hostility and antagonizing because he wasn't good at expressing himself in that way where he didn't want this pirate crew to become pirates and did it in a way that's like pirates suck like they should all die but that's because he's like i don't want you guys to end up in the same fate that i did and i'm now on this revenge trip and there were so many instances in the story where he just got shown his face again like just a reflection of himself like we ended up in this town And he started the story off so intent on this revenge story. And he's like, I want to reclaim my status. Ended up in a town and was like, had you heard of the pirate lord Dreadshot? And a shopkeeper was like, who? And I think that was the first instance where I was like, I mean, that name means nothing anymore. That's an identity that I shouldn't pursue. And then the story continued on. We had this, the conflict between our characters and between the party where I was like, I need to protect these people from themselves because they're heading down a destructive path. And then there were the moments where we met my antagonist of my story and they were a very clear representation of what I had been. They were somebody who manipulated somebody who controlled minds and just held everyone beneath their thumb. And I, and I created them. Yeah, it was, it was such a interesting journey to be on. And then to, the the arguments felt so relevant, like they needed to happen because you had your belief, I had mine, and we had to firmly stand by what we believed in because that's what characters do. They believe in something and they got to go for it. To make good characters, you think, what do they want? What's in the way? How are they going to get it? That's good character building. Right. And I think one of the other things with Shadow is like, it's not even that necessarily he thought you were like, wrong (laughs) about what you were saying either but he uh like he came from a family like he had some real daddy problems his father had left him had abandoned him and his father set out to be like this great pirate captain and so shadow's whole goal was always to like appease his father and to like show his dad that he could be a good captain too and he's like i can do this i can i can be this guy and then you kind of show up and you're like i don't think you want to be that guy and it like it totally broke Shadow, like his entire like mentality as well, because he was like, this is all I've ever known and all I've ever wanted to be. But you were saying things that made a lot of sense, but Shadow like also couldn't I- admit that they were making sense. And so I think that's where a lot of like Shadow's hostility came back as well. Where it was just and I think it was just, I think just both of our characters were doing the same thing, where we both like didn't really believe what we were saying, but just like it it came out in anger. But I think where this comes back to trust is that I would never, ever be able to do this at a table with people I didn't trust. Like I was just saying, like I I had a lot of myself in this character and I would never be able to be so emotionally involved in this character and have such emotional conversations if I didn't trust this group and I knew that we were not, we were were going to be okay (laughs) at the end of all of this. I, I think in talking about trust, you have to talk about being in an evil party because... Evil parties are particularly interesting when it comes to trusting each other at the table. Because, so the first time I was in an evil party, immediately the question comes to mind about, okay, but how evil? Like, when you when you think about this scale of 1 to 10 as to, like, the level of evil that your team is going to be, what is it? And I can't help but think of one campaign where uh, Logan's character just decided because we were leaving this town to cast Wall of Fire and burn it to the ground. Just because. <laughs> Many innocent people died. It was Let me laugh <laughs> maniacally at my own like, doing. <laughs> it, it did exactly as it was. It was super effective. We were in an evil party uh, and the, the general gist of the story was that my grandfather uh, used to kind of rule this world uh, and he had been dethroned because he was uh, attempting to summon like this large undead reptilian army because he was praising uh, a false god. And I didn't know about that false god stuff. I just wanted my place on the throne, no matter what it took, which led to myself praising this false god and among a series of other things. 
one of the things I didn't realize going into an evil party is simply the act of being evil for the sake of being evil. Because when you think of evil characters and wanting to play an evil character, there's kind of this, like, I have this goal that I want, and being evil means that I'll have, I'll do whatever means I want to to get that goal. And so there's this kind of rationality you make around playing an evil character. But in reality, evil is evil. And so you can actually play a chaotic evil character and just do malicious things within the world. And I had to kind of look at myself and say, is this the line that I am crossing role playing as a player? Is that something I actually want to do? Because when I was thinking about playing an evil party, I was like, okay, this is going to be fun because I get to just do whatever to get to my goal. But then what happened was we were just being assholes to the world. <laughs> and so I felt like it was kind of a successful exercise of trust in like, because an evil party ultimately just kind of pushes that line a little further and a little further. And it's interesting as a player because you have to make the decision about how much your character chooses to regret or whether they think that they've made a mistake at some point. And then the more the kind of party gets together to agree that they're not making mistakes, it means that you're kind of pushing these boundaries further and further. And so I would say, like, if you're kind of starting a new game, let it be a good party before you try being an evil party. I certainly wouldn't have been as successful in an evil party if I wasn't playing with people that I knew reasonably well. Because even just, like, burning down a village just for the sake of it, I was like, uh, meh. and that, And that's just, like, the start of what kind of moves in a campaign of malicious evil characters, right? I feel like I need to defend my character now, because it wasn't just for the sake of it. Welcome to character trial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was Kalista evil? Yes. Was there a reason behind that burning of the town? Also, yes. I was going to say, as a, as a DM, if it's not a group that I've played a lot with before, I tend to have a hard rule, no evil. And if someone really gives a good, like a really good character idea that could work and that I think I'm like, okay, this won't, you can be evil, but it's not going to like ruin the party. I'm like, you have to be good or lawful. I was like, because a lawful evil person still will work with people. A chaotic evil person, it is really unlikely that they're going to work with people and that, that you're not going to get that person that, you know, starts stealing from the party or is like, oh, I'm just going to kill Jason's character because, you know, he took my sandwich. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. I'm chaotic evil. So I think it could be fun maybe running a chaotic evil party where everyone is, but you have to go in with a group that trusts each other and you all are like on board with this thing. I think otherwise, yeah, new groups and definitely, definitely for new groups. It's like, I, I try to like, be like, be good or neutral. If you must be evil, if there's something that really, really works, you have to be lawful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that 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 evil game was definitely a uh, I definitely wouldn't if if you're playing with a group of first timers, definitely be like, nope, you're all good, because I would be <laughs> concerned about the player whose first tabletop experience was in a de an evil game. It's like, all right, let's play with you again. See who you are now. <laughs> Not that right. I expect that they would be completely molded to be I'm evil every time now, but I'd be like. Your first taste was in evil. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not trust them, Danny? <laughs> I, I, you know, I would be concerned. I would be concerned. <laughs> Everyone comes to the table. I want to be knights in shining armor. And they're like, I want to watch the world burn. <laughs> Bring me to the next prompt. What can we do when it seems there's a lack of trust at the table? <laughs> Reassure me you're not going to play an evil character for your first game, I hope. I can speak more from a DM's end on this than, than as a player, because uh, thankfully I tend to only play it now in situations where it is people I know quite well. But as a DM, I've definitely had situations where maybe not even like a full lack of trust in the player, but just like something they do is just like no one likes at the table. Like they, they make an inappropriate joke or something. And I think as a DM, a big thing, that you need to do is make sure that your players fully trust you every time. It's the only reason I can constantly throw very hard encounters at my players. And they're like, Logan's never TPK'd us. 
Like they're chow. I don't think I've ever TPK'd you guys. You killed us in Strahd. Okay. <laughs> Strahd that, that's designed that way. Yeah. Yeah. Just, but does Strahd yeah. really count? Like, <laughs> well, I also I think it's funny. I threw a fireball at them, and then what they decided to do was run into about a ten by ten foot room all mm. together. And I was like, this is a very intelligent enemy. Cloud kill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was probably our fault. <laughs> not off track. I have had times where like players have like made like a joke that was like not appropriate. And it's like, snip that right there. Like it's not an after the session type thing, I think, as a DM. Because that whole session you'll have people who are uncomfortable then. And you're just like, hey, that's not cool. And I think saying something like, you know, this is like I don't think it needs to be hostile at first being like but just saying hey that's not cool don't do that again please and if they do it again then being like okay you know what like either right then end the session and be like you know what afterwards talk to the person or tell them they're not welcome again but like as a dm your trust comes from making a safe place for the rest of your players and that lets you you know if your players then trust you you get to tell really cool stories like the ones that dallas and denny got to talk about that couldn't happen in a table where they didn't trust me because it would just like, you know, everyone would be uncomfortable or they'd be like, oh, Logan's going to throw us into some PvP battle for his own maniacal, chaotic, <laughs> evil enjoyment. <laughs> I spent that whole campaign preparing for a PvP battle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think there, there's a really funny element where, yeah, I, we've talked about this, but we were, I think we began to specifically build our characters in a way where we could defeat the other. I was thinking about it all the time. Yeah. I did like that, that Matt had brought up, and I wish that we had ended that last session a little earlier because that's like, I kind of want to see what the PvP would be like. <laughs> <laughs> who would win it's probably denny though so i'm glad he, he could didn't. fly <laughs> he could fly and that was a problem for shadow yeah that was the big fact you know it was in so interesting to analyze you in that sense because it was like shadows faster than me if they catch me they do so much damage in a single strike and they're sure certain to hit me and i'm like how can i resolve this i need to learn to fly somehow i did have guns though my plan was to shoot down your wings if you tried to fly you know, at some point, we should do a breakdown, like a theoretical battle of how, how would this, this would have played go. out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to kind of move to the prompt of the. Uh, Tired of listening to them talk about their shit. Yeah. Back to the prompt. Back to the prompt <laughs> about uh, restoring trust. I can't help but think of just like the basic things you do in a friendship to gain trust. And like as as a player, wanting to like understand the relationship with another player uh within the game a lot of that is listening it, it's it can be as simple as just like letting other people talk having an understanding like making sure that everyone has an opportunity to raise suggestions and go with them or when you're coming up with a plan trying to implement multiple people's strategies and also like as a player yourself recognizing when you may have talked too much because at the end of the day, when you're telling a story and what is kind of the critical portion of that story is speaking, telling the story, you want to make sure that everyone can participate. And certainly, I feel like building trust comes from making sure as a player that you listen. It's important to perhaps let other people have moments or possibly embrace and add to those moments, find opportunities to just go. I, I'm going to put myself with you as opposed to I'm going to put myself in front of you in those kinds of cases. Yeah, I think you actually you bring up a really good point in like just trust can be established like in the same way friend, friendship is. If you don't know somebody at the table, try and get to know them outside the game. Like the best groups function because probably because they're close friends. And so if you want to make a group work, put in the effort to become friends <laughs> and also like just be curious like i i can't help but think of like meeting friends in kindergarten where it's like my best friend at the age of five years old became my best friend because i fell down and they helped me up that was the basis of the friendship there was one action that happens and then after that you're bffs that's it and so having that kind of openness i think is important as well i mean 
I can't help but think sometimes we close ourselves in a lot. And uh, sometimes we let preconceived judgments get in the way of just being able to sit down and go, okay, I'm here to have fun with these people. Let's find things we like to have in common and go from there, right? Moving away from the actual table dynamic, what can we do when it's characters that don't trust each other instead of the players? This feels like a harder question to me. Build them to BP each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This hey. is more of a question of how can you role play, I suppose, or what story mechanics can you use? And that might start, the, the players might initiate that, or it might be something that the DM has to do down the road, especially in the the campaign that the three of us, uh, Dallas, Logan, and myself, we started in a lot of the characters didn't trust each other. So, L Logan, how have you how have you begun to mitigate that? Or did you? Um, and that one was actually really interesting because I think I just had things in my back pocket if things really blew up. I was kind of like in the prepare the preparedness of like. In that campaign, we had one person who became evil for a bit, who had a completely different goal, essentially work with the party until a moment, then throw them under the bus. We had Danny's character and Dallas's character who were at butting heads. And so it was always like this, like there is a moment where this group might not be the adventuring party anymore, like the, the characters, not the players. And I think it's just like everyone, like it definitely, I'm pretty sure with Matt, who had the character who was evil for a bit. I'm pretty sure we had talks of like, you know, if his character got to a point where they had to leave the party and it's like coming in with someone new, you know, there are times I think, you know, a, that maybe is, is one of the, the most useful tools is like, if your characters absolutely cannot find a reason to be adventuring together anymore, it doesn't mean that you have to stop playing the game. Characters can retire. Characters can go off to join another group of adventurers in the world. If you're playing that type, they could, I assume in Matt's character's position where he was evil and had an active goal against, there could have been an opportunity. I definitely had planned was an opportunity for him to join the bad guys. And he probably then would have been a boss fight later in the campaign. But I think there's always, always something there. I would never be like, you know, even if you were in the middle of like a crazy multi-level dungeon and it got to that point i would never have a way where it's like the player has to choose to like play these characters that aren't comfortable together anymore and have a bad time like i would never force that or choose to not be playing at all i'd be like great you found a lost adventure in these dungeons and that's dallas's new character <laughs> explain who you are and why you're here like you know i know some people maybe that's not you know the game's for them becomes like everything has to like realistically make sense. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think just realizing the like, okay, you have to give a moment soon to get someone back in or a moment soon to let these characters part. How do you do that? Talk with them. If someone both are really set on playing those characters, like no one wants to, to stop. Then, you know, I think you have to have the talk and be like, you two need to figure out what's going to make your characters work together. I can throw something. I can be like, oh, great. You have a parent alive. You have a cousin alive. They've both been kidnapped by the same big, bad, evil boy. You guys have to work together to save your families. Like, I'll, I will just throw something like that if you need it. But I, I think, yeah, those are kind of my two. Talk with them or always give the option that, like, you know, you don't have to play the same character. I think it's worth noting, too smaller transgressions and I, I think of things like if one character wants to sleight of hand an item out of another character's hand or if one character wants to convince another that something is true and like you know meta game they know as a person that the thing is false but they want to try and convince the party otherwise i've seen different dms try to solve those situations in different ways some like thoroughly use checks and then the way those checks go like them's the rules and then moving forwards you role play within those checks succeeding or failing others have met at it based on passive checks to say like you know you can't bamboozle this player because their passive insight is enough to see through it 
and then they can just shut it down by using stats. And I, I think that there's clever ways to try to solve D and D microaggressions because they can kind of happen that way, where people try to use the stats to do something like kind of small against another player, right? And you can use various stats and checks to try to de-escalate those kinds of things from either like to basically prevent them from happening at all if you can read the table and it's like you know one player is very against this thing happening you know they want to hold on to their magical gauntlet they don't want the other player to take this item that was very clearly built by the dm for them like (laughs) those kinds of situations and i've definitely been as well kind of as a sign of trust for example where i have let my character be persuaded and that's kind of a way you can also build that up as well, where you may not have intended it, but when you fail those checks, things can move forwards from that. So, it, and there's kind of like, there's there's those like, characters can explode moments, and then there's those like, smaller, minute moments where it's like, oh, I sent something where it might be a concern between these players that grows larger in the future. And obviously, as you learn as a player and as a DM, I imagine you get better at picking out those things. But it's worth noting that in addition to like making sure you have open communication with players about where they want their characters to go and making sure they know they have the options to leave their players in the world to do other stuff, you can also use little tactics in game to try to solve some of those smaller things. I think another thing you can do here is you can make a choice as a player rather than a choice as a character. You know, I, I, I'm i just thinking back. This is a moment we've talked about on this podcast before, but there was a moment back in the pirate campaign with good old Theodore where he threatened to murder all pirates in front of the pirate crew. And it was like, as a character, I was like, there's no way that I let this man back on my ship as a as a captain. How can I do that? But as a player, you have to kind of sometimes make choices to allow the game to continue forward to, you know, trust that we've got this group that, you know, it's all going to work out in the end. And to just like, it was a moment where, you know, as uh, where I did, you know, let him back on the ship, I demoted him, but he got (laughs) back on the ship. We didn't leave him behind and force him to make a new character. I mean, you know, I think, you know, player, the table dynamics and the table, like friendliness comes before character choices so you know i i wouldn't want to make a character choice that would force denny to have to create a new character right so i i think sometimes you do have to like when things do get really heated between trusting characters sometimes you do just kind of have to go with it and like abandon the character choice for a second just to let the story to continue to progress that actually it was like when jason was talking was reminding me of something in that like is very in a similar vein but definitely to a less uh intense is sometimes when a new player joins, why do the other characters trust this person? Or what is going to be the thing? And the campaign I'm running right now, one of our friends who's like, oh, I really want to play D&D again. I was like, hey, hop in. We've got room. So you made a new character. And he had a little quest I gave him to start off. I was like, okay, maybe he'll convince the party to do this. But he was like, in game, he's like, there's no reason for these people to help me. It seems like it's going to be really hard at this point. So you know what? I'm going to put my my personal quest thing that I have right now aside. And let's just go where the other players want to go. And he just made his character. Like he made the choice to be like, I'm just going to be like a really helpful person that wants to go along with them. Like these people who like seem nice to me. And, you know, the characters now he's done some things to earn some of their trust at least. And like it got an, an easy in. Uh, and didn't get the issue, which I've definitely had both with like characters I've made or like characters coming into games I've been a player in, where it's like that first session where it's like, here's a new character. If they have something going on, it's like, why do I want to help out this new person in this world? And it's like, you know why? Because at the end of the day, Logan wants to play with Jason. Exactly. Bob doesn't want to help help Steve out, but but Logan wants to play with Jason. And I will... As Dallas said, like, yeah, make that choice. Yeah, there's a bit of a metagame you can do that's clearly for the benefit of the group to ensure that the party continues to play the characters that they've invested in, even if things seem a little rocky or there seems to be a lack of trust. 
But I think something else that players can do to begin to erode the mistrust, as opposed to the trust, want to build the trust, is to kind of take into account your relationships with the other characters. Like, what is your relationship currently with this character? Identify the goal, like, what do you want the relationship to be between these characters? And I think that that goal, unless the group is very trusting, the goal should be a positive relationship of some kind. And then identify what your character can do for that other character to begin building that pathway. Like, in the case of this, we we keep coming back to Theodore and Shadow, the two characters that me and (laughs) Dallas played. Clearly, my character had presented themselves aggressively. They were very misunderstood and they didn't know how to communicate properly. And the steps Theodore began to try and get a positive relationship with Shadow was to become more submissive. Like, I got demoted. I didn't make a huff about it. I fell into the role. I used my skills for the party's benefit where I could. And... I began to share the information that I'd been withholding, but which, of course, they viewed as why are you hiding so many secrets instead of, oh, you finally revealed that because the information I was keeping secret being revealed actually threatened my character's life, which they didn't know they couldn't understand. But it's it's an interesting thing to kind of track where you want a relationship to go and how you can get there. It's like I just said, you know, what do you want? What's in the way? How are you going to get it? And the second character we made for Logan's second campaign there, I was like, I don't want that to be as much of a obstacle this time. So I'm making a character who is very outgoing, a character who is very receptive, who attaches easily to people like first session, myself and Michael's characters. I saw him. I was like, I'm basically your guardian angel. Now somebody threw a chair at him, knocked it out of the air. You're under my protection. And that that was the role I quickly fell into is like, I want to be a positive force this time. So I think just keeping in mind the goal of a positive relationship between characters for your character. Were there were there ever any issues of character trust within the campaign that you, Jason and Logan were a part of? You know, there was a moment that it was definitely not like players. It was fully just the characters, but it was. um when Adam got that cursed sword, Ryan's character had just been with us for like a day or two at that point, And they start fighting Adam because he's cursed and Ryan because he's defending himself. But my character, like Logan fully was like, yeah, I, I know what's going on. But Saren is like seeing her father essentially be attacked by someone she just met. And Saren did not trust Ryan's character for quite a while after that. I think they definitely had a rocky relationship as two characters, partially because Saren was a brat. Love her to death as a character, but oh boy. But two, it's like, oh, she tried to just straight up like defend her father and probably threw like a fireball at him. Like just went full defense and like thankfully was a character who had spare dying to, to help the party. But um but yeah, I think there was there was definitely a moment there that like then the characters they like grew as it went on and like by the end Saren definitely trusted everyone in that party with her life. But it was like, oh, this new person came in, big thing happened that was not his fault at all. But all I saw, like all Saren saw was, oh, this new person is now attacking someone who I only recently remembered is super important in my life. Yeah, it resulted in Ryan's suggestions for a little while almost becoming obstacles to progress, where it was like, let us remind you that you attempted to be very violent right when we met you. And and so it's like, like, and how we turned that around was, of course, Ryan... uh, through his character effectively showing proof that he wanted to be on our side through continuing to have like combats or other encounters where he has actually helped us as miles Uh, his character's name is miles and uh, i i think it relatively quickly resolved but certainly that moment where the curse went off was relatively heated because we didn't know 
if Adam's character was actually going to slay anyone. <laughs> it got pretty close. <laughs> we were all very concerned about what it, what specifically was going to go on in that PvP interaction. It was, yeah, it, I, what was it, 1v5? And he almost won, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, rogues are powerful. <laughs> no, no, that Adam was a, a, a battle master fighter. Oh, yes, yes. And, I mean, we literally ended that because of a Deus Ex Machina moment. <laughs> like, that, that's how that kind of, that conflict ended. There's another moment, actually, that uh, I, I think is interesting, because there's kind of, there's actually how D and D can you can learn things about the other players from experiences that you have with them in D and D, and I can't help but think of this moment where so I'm playing an insane goblin character, and he finds an eyeball, and the character that Adam is playing is blind in one eye from being slashed on the eye. So Tuck Tuck has this great idea of wanting to give Adam's character the eye and so we end up having this encounter where tuk tuk is completely convinced that uh, arturos that's the name of his character that arturos wants this like glass eye that will allow him to have full sight again but it turns out that real meta the player doesn't like eye stuff and we learned this from having this D D encounter and then it's like well I was like, oh, okay, of course, once we figure that out, we kind of back it all up and like put it in a box and set it aside and like throw the eye away. But it was fascinating to have this moment in D&D &D that was like, oh, we're learning more about you because we got into this unbreached territory that we wouldn't have never like known that that was how everything was going to come up. There's no kind of ill foul or ill intention upon making this happen. From my character's perspective, I'm like being silly within the game until I know better, or until I know otherwise. I, I think that that could have gone very differently if that if the trust wasn't there at the table. But certainly, there are definitely moments in D and D where I think, as a player, if there's something that's making you uncomfortable, speaking out about it sooner rather than later is very important because you don't want to like be in this interaction where you're like oh, no, I don't really want to be in this interaction, but I also don't want to, like, cancel it out because of what I'm thinking. It's like, well, no, actually, if you're not having fun, it's okay to say that, to move on in progression in the story in a way that's exciting and entertaining for everyone. You're allowed to be like, hey, like, let's just, you know, not do this thing. And I, I hope that no D&D players, like, experience pressure to let something happen against what they're thinking or what their feelings are about their character for the sake of like this event that happens to be happening in that moment, you know, like I imagine that characters could feel or players could feel pressure to change their characters in ways that they wouldn't like. Uh, and in that particular moment, after we kind of learned all of this and figured it out, uh, of course the eye didn't go in Arturos. And it was important that uh, we all learned that so that it didn't come up again, despite the fact that his character is blind in one eye. Right. So it, it all comes back to communication, you know, just keeping keeping the conversation open, making sure that everybody is comfortable. Get it in the session zero, figuring out what are the boundaries? What are the limits? What are the safeguards that we're going to put in place to make sure that if somebody is uncomfortable, they can put like Dallas mentioned earlier, that yellow card up to just be like, okay, we got to veer away from this topic. I am uncomfortable. And it's important to be able to say that. And the enjoyment of the game is what's important overall, the enjoyment and the safety. How about we move into a game then? Hell yeah. Oh, yes. Sure. We haven't played this game in quite some time, and I'm very excited to get back to this. Uh, today, what we're going to be doing is one of us is going to be putting forward a prompt of some kind, at least in their head, and everybody else is going to be asking 20 questions in order to be able to figure out what this thing is. This is D20 Questions. I, I love, love that, that the music plays for us as well. I kind of always imagine that you put that on after the fact, but I really do enjoy that we get to hear it as well. I mean, that's what I had been doing, but now we're, we're live. We're doing it live. <laughs> so 
it's D20 questions, but we're doing it with D&D themes. Dallas is going to be the one picking the thing that we have to ask about. Dallas, do you have your particular D&D thing prepared? I have a D&D thing. I hope I can answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> and for everybody else who is asking questions, remember these have to be yes or no questions. But otherwise, shall we get to it? Do it. Sure thing. Roll to go first. I don't have a die on my table. You know, we can roll initiative or, or we'll take turns. So Jason, myself, Logan or Jason, Logan, myself. Sure. sure. Logan, you'll go second. <laughs> it sounds like I'm asking the first question. <laughs> yeah. Jason gets to fuck up first. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is what I was dreaming of. So so my question to you, Dallas, first, then. Yeah. Is this thing a living thing? Yes. I said I was going to keep track of the questions, and I immediately forgot to keep track of that one, but I'm doing it. Is this thing a player race? No. Is this thing a monster of some kind? No. Would you find this thing in nature? You could. Is this thing sentient? Yes. Is this thing an item? No. Oh. I thought it was Shadow's magic talking sword until Teddy <laughs> said that. <laughs> That'd be a good one, though. I forgot about yeah. that. It's got to be an official thing, so homebrew will keep out. <laughs> so is this thing an animal? No. Does this thing live on land? Yes. It, or other places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, except when it doesn't. <laughs> Is this thing, would this thing be considered an NPC? It could be. Oh, dear. We've gone down a, a, an incorrect path somewhere, I think. All we know right now is it's not a player character race. It's not a monster. It is self-aware. It is sentient. Yeah. yeah. By the sound of it, it sounds like it's something humanoid. Like, is it an undead thing is what I wonder. Oh. Yeah, like I think I've led you astray <laughs> calling it <laughs> sentient and alive, maybe not the correct way of describing it. <laughs> is he either alive or it isn't? Wait, wait, but things are either alive or they aren't. Not gonna say. I want you to take a look at the list of things we're allowed to pick from <laughs> and, and and reference that. Okay, look at the list of topics we can choose in these the games. Um, I think it's Jason's turn to ask a question. Sure is. Oh, now I'm so confused by that. <laughs> uh, it could be an NPC. Is this thing magical? Yes. I, th I think I know what's happening here. I have no idea. <laughs> That's ten questions. Ten questions. And this thing isn't magical or it was? It, it is magical. Is this thing a spell? No. Is this thing a class? Yeah. Are classes alive? Yeah, I get what you're saying yeah. now. That's yeah, like, I understand. Yeah. I see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get the confusion there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I would consider a class more like a title, so I don't think it is alive. Okay. But we're there now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have a couple extra questions. Yeah. No, no, I think we'll get it. You know it's magical. Um... <laughs> Should we just start guessing every magical class? You just like, like, does this class start with a W? <laughs> uh, exactly. I have specifically included in the rules that no questions can be about letters. Okay. Oh, yes, I do okay. see that. <laughs> does it rhyme with lizard? No. <laughs> <laughs> you could just ask the question, is, is it, it a, a wizard? wizard? <laughs> is it a wizard? No. Is it a full caster? So... To define what a full caster is, there are some classes that are full casters, some that are half casters, you, and even three quarter casters. Things like Paladin, Ranger, those are half casters. Uh, I don't know if I'm... Artificer would be a half caster too, I guess. Whereas full casters are like Wizard, Sorcerer, Warlock, maybe? <laughs> Warlock's a weird one, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Eldritch Blast is a full caster. <laughs> Bard... Cleric and Druid would also be full casters. No, it is not a full caster. Oh god, it's my turn. Um, is it... Is it a paladin? No. 
You've got like seven questions left, so I can narrow it down. You have five questions left. Yep. Five? Oh. I mean, it's not a full caster. Yeah, it's not a full caster. And it's not a paladin. They've yeah. kind of narrowed it down. Yeah, I've narrowed it down. So is it a ranger? No. Hold on. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I. Oh, no. <laughs> that is just an oh, no. And the... <laughs> <laughs> I got to wait till my turn to ask my question. <laughs> Is this class always a caster? No. Yeah, that's... That's... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, is it a subclass? But here we are. So so I guess that does mean that it is a subclass in a way. Um, is it the arcane trickster? No. Oh, God. I don't know what subclass is. How many more questions? We have three? Two, I uh, think. I have two. two. But yeah, two. Yeah. You're not that close. I mean, Eldritch Knight is like the other one that I can think of off the top of my head. So we know it's not a full caster. It's a subclass that is magical. That is magical. Um, Can it even cast spells, though, or does it just have magical abilities? That's a thing, right? I bet you that's it. (laughs) The audience can't see Dallas's face right now. (laughs) Yeah. I think we changed the video to just Dallas <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's oh man. All in well, favor. Jason, you have the second last question. I know. I'm trying to. I I, I want to guess. Like, is it? I want to ask. Is it a subclass of X? And I'm trying to figure Ooh, out. It's a risky real. biscuit, right? Based on the other prompts. I <laughs> I think I might know what this is. Um, I have a good question. Oh, uh, is it an evil subclass or usually evil? No. All right. My question is, is this a subclass you are playing in a campaign that we are in together right now? No, but I certainly thought about picking that subclass. I fully thought I was like, oh. I think, Denny, you at least should get one more because you've had one less than everyone else. But that would make it 21 questions. All right, well, whatever. It's only a D20. (laughs) Listen, I'm a lawful NPC here running this podcast. I mean, I got to follow my rules. So you all get a guess then? Yes, what does get to happen is we do each get to guess what we think it is. So we'll we'll go in the same order. Jason, would you like to go? Sure. Um, Is it the Battlesmith from Artificer? No. Is it the... Was it Wild Magic Barbarian or whatever the hell it's called now? Uh, no. Is it the Eldritch Knight? No. What was oh, it? Good guess. The Echo Knight. Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah, I, see, I was like, these guys know d and I'm going to pick a hard one, but maybe I went too hard because we didn't <laughs> even really get to fight her. So. I will admit there's a lot of reading I got to do in Tasha still. <laughs> well, and Echo Knight's really new as well. I was also, it's I was not like, even okay, in Tasha's. Oh, is it not? No, it's in... Um, it's in Wild it's in, Mount. Um, ah. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have known that at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Michael played one in our campaign. That's the only reason I know what it is. Yeah, and Adam Adam did play one in a game with myself, Jason, Nick. Wait a minute. Yes. Yes, it was. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, it was Adam's brother. My apologies. I was like, Adam was the DM, though. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was a good pick. That that was quite the challenge. I liked that. Yeah, that was tough. Yeah, maybe I should have gone with the the zealot barbarian. Which I was my original thought. I would have gone in that one. <laughs> I know you would have. Yeah, maybe I should have done it. But it's just in Discord the other day. I proclaimed my love for that subclass, and I was like, it's going to be too obvious if I pick that for D twenty questions right away. <laughs> so I picked a different subclass, but maybe I went too hard. So I do think we do have a bit of a of a deadline in time. So I don't think we can go a second round. But thank you, Dallas, for choosing that. No, we can actually. Oh. My deadline has changed. Well, well, Ooh. well. Yeah. In <laughs> that <laughs> case, would you all like to go a second round? Hell yeah. I want a redemption arc. Absolutely. All right. Well, because nobody got that right, Dallas can choose another one or somebody else can choose one. I will refrain because I did the first topic in the first time we played this game several episodes ago no let's uh pass it off logan jason rock paper scissors sure yeah. oh gotta love me that audio <laughs> that <was> that. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Yeah. Purely visual. That's right. <laughs> uh, I will have the audience know that Jason chose scissors and Logan chose paper. What are you talking about? <laughs> I chose fire. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason is choosing our next topic. All right. Let me think for a moment. Okay. I think you'll, I think you'll get this. This is something that I like. I, I don't give you a topic at all. Nope. Yep. No. All right. So just to let you know, it does have to be an NP, a type of NPC, a monster, a class, race, magical item, or player's handbook rule. Yep. Very good. Excellent. Alice, you start. Is it a monster? No. Is it a class? Nope. Is it a race? Nope. Is it a magical item? It is. There we go. Is this magical item game breaking? No. It's not the deck of many things. <laughs> oh, it, it, if that's your definition of game breaking, no. No, it is not. <laughs> then absolutely it is, yes. <laughs> yeah. That is a question that is a bit opinionated. <laughs> that is very yeah. true. Uh, okay, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, is it something you would likely find at a lower level? I don't think so. No. Okay. If, if, if I got to phrase it a different way, is it very rare or higher? That's what I'm, I, yeah, I'm like, I just got to make sure that I'm saying this correctly. Is it very rare or higher? Mm-hmm. No. Is it a weapon? No. Is it a one-time use? No. Is it an uncommon item? No. Did this item appear in the campaign that you played with Logan and Denny? Yes. Great. I'm here for you guys. I'm going to help you guys get this answer. Nice. <laughs> can I, if I think I might know what it is, can I just guess? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That uses is, up one of our, yeah. one of our 20 questions, but is you can, it the you can ever guess. smoking bottle? Oh, that's also a good one. <laughs> I like that one very much, but no. I remember you using that a I, lot. I love that. Oh, it's item. common though, so. Uh, but no, it is not that one. Should have looked that. <laughs> what the hell did you guys use in my game? Denny's going through his notes of all the things he gave <laughs> right. out to us. <laughs> is it a piece of, is it something you wear? Yes. Mm, I think I know what it is. Did you wear it, Jason? I did. Yeah. Magical items did you have? I don't remember. This was so long ago. Do Does it go on your feet? No. I think I might have lost track of questions somewhere along the line, but I think we've each got one more. This will be 18. Yes. Like after you okay. ask. It. Yeah, yeah. But I might get it here. Is it Heward's Handy Haversack? Sure is. <laughs> I love that item. It is a backpack that is kind of like a bag of holding, except for goes on your back and can carry much more. Yeah, it's a super big bag of holding. I never knew that item. Uh, one of my characters held a magical backpack, and then after a story reveal, it turned into a Heward's Handy Haversack for the sake of keeping it around. Mm-hmm. It was originally what housed his magical abilities, the source of which was a mercury-like metal that was poisoning his mind. But yeah, no, that, cool. that was a good choice. Yeah, I was like, what item do I think they would get, but is oddly specific? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a nice item. Cloak of the Manta Ray was going to be a close second. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what would have been a close too. second? Cloak of the Manta Ray. Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, I know that one. Yeah, your character can swim. Swim, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might not have got that if Dallas didn't ask if it was an item that appeared in my game. So good. Because I ran out of questions about magical items. I don't know what Even with that, I was <laughs> like, what items did he have? I just knew what I had. <laughs> well, yeah, and of course, since I was DM, I knew what you all had. I mean, I mean, in fact, I made like a spreadsheet for it. I was like, what do they got? What am I giving them? Uh, <laughs> thank you for the game, guys. That was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I like this game. I like it's it's like a nice like cooperative game up until the very end. But. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even feel like somebody wins. Like, it kind of feels like the group still kind of gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The, yeah. This brings us on to our final segment of the podcast, which is Question Dicely, our chance to hear from the listeners. Today's question is brought in by Sheldon Caldwell and the Cadets. You can follow him on Instagram as Shellfish16. And he asks, 
Do you prefer playing with miniatures, theater of the mind, or both? It's a good question. It depends. I feel like, in general, theater of the mind is more accessible. But I have definitely played in encounters that have been more clear with miniatures. Kind of depends on the DM playstyle, really. I wouldn't say that miniatures are necessary, but I would say that use whatever tools you want to illustrate where you are. Yeah, I think pre-pandemic, we used to play a lot of theater of the mind. And I, I do really like playing that way. And even now that we have moved to Roll20, we do still have like long chunks of time in a game where we don't use the miniatures and we just talk through things as well. And I, I think there are benefits to both. I think battle or like encounters sometimes are easier uh, with miniatures because sometimes you have to be like, every turn comes up and you're like, okay, wait, where are the enemies in relation to me? Are they within 10 feet of me? Is it, are two of them within 10 feet of me? Like sometimes you end up having to like have a lot of questions with the DM uh, where having miniatures makes things a lot easier. The one thing that I've really enjoyed since moving to Roll20 that I think is really cool is the dynamic lighting that exists in Roll20. And the ability to, like, each character can actually only see what their character can see. So if you don't have dark vision, you can only see, like, a little square around your character token. Or it, you can't see until you move far enough into an area. I think that's brought up some really interesting moments as we've been playing where someone walks into a room and they're like, oh, this is not great. And the rest of the party is way back and they don't know what you found. And I, I find that has in- introduced some really interesting new dynamic to the game. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with all that. I think pre-pandemic, just space and whatnot, I was like, yeah, theater of the mind's fine. But now that I've been using Roll20, I think I've talked about this the second that we can have campaigns in person. I was like, I still want to maybe use Roll20 for like combat and stuff and like dungeon exploration where I want them to like be moving through the thing. And it's not just me, me narrating it. I find as a DM, especially for combat miniatures make things go faster and way smoother i think with theater of the mind a thing to consider is you should err on the side of the players you know if they're like can i throw this and hit both of them and you weren't clear enough in your description i usually tend to be like yep because that's me not describing it well enough uh with the miniatures they can just see that and i can remember to put the things at the opposite ends of the room so they can't just fireball <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think this question is great, too, because it'll it'll kind of bring us back into our our overall topic for today. As far as what I prefer, I think there's a place for a little bit of both. Theater of the mind is great when you're trying to do or like things aren't as dire. Like it's a combat for combat's sake, like positioning isn't super important. It's more of a reason to get the players rolling some dice, attacking some stuff, and they're probably not going to die. But if it's a high stakes battle, like and it's a big antagonist or the battlefield has some specific uh, mechanic or gimmick about it, then absolutely. I think miniatures and a battle map is the way to go. And another thing with theater of the mind is it requires a lot of trust at the table because the dungeon master is describing what the setting looks like and the players are like, okay, I move 30 feet. Can I hit this person? And they just have to trust that you're managing the spacing of the battlefield and you're not skewing it to one side or the other. Though I agree with Logan, like if you're in question, err on the side of the players. But you just kind of got to make a call in the end. It's like, I don't know, you make one turn moving. You make another turn moving. Am I close enough? What did I say? 80 feet? Uh... Yeah, I, you're, you're going to need to make one more turn or dash this turn and just using your judgment to kind of make these calls. What I did before the pandemic, because I still think maps are superb, is I would do a mixture of both. I would I would do the overall description and then I'd be like, just to give you guys a more clear picture, quickly draw a map with like little circles of you guys are here, kind of like a football style drawing. And you guys can like point to the map now, even though we don't have miniatures and a proper to scale grid, you can tell me kind of where you're wanting to go and I'll tell you how to facilitate that. But Roll20 is great. Dynamic lighting spices everything up. It's so cool. 
This has now become an ad for Roll20. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Please sponsor us. <laughs> I was blown away the first time you used it. I was like, this changes everything about like exploring now that there's this dynamic lighting. All right, not another word about Roll20. <laughs> Roll20, if you want to get more out of us, you got to give more to us, you hear? You can email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Roll20, if you would like to ask me a question about how much I charge to give advertisements, you can send that to dicelychannel at gmail.com. And also, to the listeners, if you have a question you want us to read on Question Dicely, you can also send that to dicelychannel at gmail.com. And also leave a social media handle in the email for me to give you a shout out. Did anyone have anything more to add on that? I just kind of jumped into the uh, how you can get in touch with us. <laughs> <laughs> we trust you. We trust you. <laughs> I do, but I'm barred from talking about bleep out sight here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, no, it's a great resource, uh, folks. If If you're in need of a virtual table space, definitely check it out. Thank you all for coming on to this podcast to talk about trust and such. And, uh, I I couldn't have thought of better people to delve into this topic than you all. Oh, oh. Thanks. oh thank you. It's been fun. And now I trust if for those of you who have social media, ha- you'd like to promote your social media. Oh, are you not doing it for me anymore? <laughs> we have, we have to say our own name. <laughs> wow. Uh, your voice is it's so smooth. It's so nice. It's changed the last 10 episodes. Oh my We're not brought God. on for a while and it, it's chaos. <laughs> I play you music. <laughs> I what are you? Uh, I'm so over abused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Logan. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch at LC Kraken. Uh, I do a lot of streaming and take pictures. My most recent picture, my butt looked really good. So uh, yeah, that's the type of pictures <laughs> I take. <laughs> I'm happy for you. <laughs> You can find me on Twitter at Dallasaur, D-A-L-L-I-S-A-U-R. Or you can find me on Instagram as Dallas McKenzie. Facebook is Dallas McKenzie. Or you can visit my website, DallasMcKenzie.com. And I have no social media presence, but I occasionally play games on Logan's stream and occasionally look at pictures of his butt. <laughs> <laughs> it's your boy, JT. Uh, it's your boy, oh. JT. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you are all so funny i love you all all right Aww, i love you too <laughs> thank you everybody for tuning in to this episode of speak dicely my name is denny brant and i will speak dicely with you again soon bye 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 you can find the speak dicely podcast on podbean and most anywhere that you listen to podcasts Follow Dicely DND on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and be sure to subscribe to the Dicely DND YouTube channel, where you can find our video series on how to play Dungeons and Dragons, as well as other videos. The Speak Dicely podcast is produced and edited by myself, Denny Brandt, and the intro and outro music were created by Salik Brandt. I thank you for the support, and we'll see you next time on the Speak Dicely podcast. <laughs>